Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. May the Lord bestow upon us His blessing, mercy, grace, and wisdom now and unto the age of age. Today is the last Sunday of the last complete month of the Coptic calendar of Misra, um, and this gospel is similar to the same gospel that we read last night, and also that we will read next Sunday, uh, which has to do with the end of the world, the second coming of our Lord, and, and Judgment Day. <clears throat> um, and as you know, we always read this at the end of the year. Um, and this theme is not usually a joyful one, um, but this unique theme the church intentionally puts at the end of the year. And anyone know when? There's one other specific time of the year where we have the same relative theme or one week, or the beginning of the week. The Holy Week, the Holy Passion Week. <clears throat> so yes, it might feel dreary or morbid or depressing to, to, to think about the end of the world um, and also to think, think of uh, death, but the church places it intentionally because there is a benefit for us to um, think and prepare ourselves for uh, these things. And the more actually we reflect on death and the second coming and the afterlife in the proper way, the more we get out of this life and the more we actually feel, feel fulfilled or that we have lived a life pleasing to God. Um, since the beginning of, of man, there's been met many different responses. Um, and many common responses that we have towards death, right? The main one is fear, fear of separation, fear of loss, fear of pain, um, or anxiety of leaving the things or the people that you love behind. <clears throat> and some people use the ta different tactics, which are mostly unhealthy, of denying, thinking that you'll live forever, or trying to get the most out of life in the wrong, the, the most wrong way. Um, or procrastinating, thinking that, oh, I still have some time. Um, but the Bible teaches us that uh, death will come probably sooner than later. As St. James in his epistle of today says, um, what is your life? It is even a vapor, um, or some translations say a mist, um, that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Right? <clears throat> um, and so, as we know, life is short whether it's one year or 10 years or 100 years, in comparison to eternity, um, it's nothing. <clears throat> so, but, so it's not necessarily how long we live, but how. Um, and this is what is pleasing uh, to God, the quality of life, not in my eyes, but in those of God. <clears throat> and so the church tells us we have to prepare, we have to watch, we have to be ready. Um, but sometimes people ask, well, how? How, how do we go about doing that? Um, so there's a lot of different um, guidelines that the, the church fathers give us, especially the desert fathers, because this encompassed a lot of, of their um, daily life. Um, so we'll go into just a few points on how to prepare for death uh, in, in as joyful a way as we can. Um, so the first thing that we have to do is we have to have the remembrance of death. Um, it, it helps with those who are in denial or procrastinating, the, re the realization of the fact that you will die, um, which all of us, um, even Enoch and Elijah, the, the great ones who seem to have escaped death um, that was thousands of years ago, will also come back, according to the book of Revelation, on this earth and experience the taste of death, but for a short time, <clears throat> three and a half days, as it says in Revelation. Um, but the, the Holy Scriptures tell us to take it to heart, to have this remembrance um, of, of death and take it to heart, as the book of Ecclesiastes says. And the book of Sirach actually has a very uh, clear guidance on this. Uh, for example, in, in uh, chapter 28, it says, remember the end of your life. Um, and later it says, remember corruption and death and be true to the commandments. <clears throat> And then in chapter 7, verse 36, it says, In all you do, remember the end of your life, and then you will never sin. So there's a benefit to it, that the more I remember the end, the less I sin. 
Um, and we'll see later on how um, this uh, comes to, to fruition in the spiritual life of our Willie. Um, but uh, the Desert Fathers had this as one of their exercises to always remember the day of their departure. Even <clears throat> St. Isaac the Syrian, he says, um, even when it's time to go to bed, he says, when it's time for sleep and you approach your bed, he says, say bed, perhaps this night you will become my grave. I do not know, right? It sounds depressing, depressing and morbid. But then he says, in your heart, you will always be ready for your departure if you do this, right? He says, if you are wise, you will expect it at every hour. Each day say to yourself, perhaps this, the messenger who comes to fetch me has already reached the door. What am I doing sitting here? So, uh, of course, the, the Desert Fathers took it to, to a high level, but maybe we just do it, if we can't do it every day or multiple times a day, at least the church is saying, do it every year um, or do it every month before your confession or do it every week before you take communion, right? So this remembrance will help us not only prepare for the end, but better our life now. Um, <clears throat> and he says, go to sleep with these thoughts every night. He says, reflect on them every day. And when the messenger arrives, you will go joyfully to meet him, death, saying, come in peace. I knew you would come, and I have not neglected anything that could help me on my journey, right? So what's better, to be a little worried about thinking about it now or be, you know, um, weeping and gnashing of teeth after? Of course, um, a, a little preparation and thoughtfulness, even in uncomfort, um, now will grant us peace and joy and um uh, salvation in the future. Okay, so this is what one one aspect is to remember the death, but another aspect is well, remember what comes after that, right? Think about the heavenly, um, what it's like, who's there, what you're going to do, how you will feel, um, <clears throat> what are, what is the experience or what is the taste of the person um, or of your of you when you leave the body. Um, it won't be you won't feel pain, right? Um, we won't. Uh, be angry, will be, God willing, in, in the multitude of the presence of, of the angels and saints, and most most importantly, our heavenly bridegroom, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, right? <clears throat> um, and so, um, why does the church tell us to do that? Because then it helps put things in perspective. We're not just living to live here. <laughs> We're living so that we can live forever with, with our Lord. Um, and so when we do that, we end up not becoming too comfortable in this place. Um, it's like when you're, um, as St. Paul says, this is our tent, and we're pre preparing to take off the tent so that we, ha we have a, a better abode, right? Um, I remember um, the days when we were planning to move um, from one house to another. We were trying to prepare our kids uh, for this um, and they were upset it was like no we love this house we don't want to go anywhere um, and and they enjoyed of course like that's the normal thing is we enjoy what is familiar we don't want to change we feel good and happy this way um, I like my life my friends my routines um, can't we just stay here um, <clears throat> um, I said well it's either one or the other we're not going to have both we can't we can't Right, um, um, and we sold this place so we can buy the other one. Right, um, our whole life we, we've we've been preparing for you to have a better a, a better um, place to live. Right, um, <clears throat> and they weren't completely convinced. <laughs> right, um, so nostalgia is one thing, but the better living outweighs the other. So, um, fortunately, we were able to go and visit the new place and say, look, look how big it is. <laughs> look how much nicer it's going to be. Imagine you, your room is going to be here instead of, you know, um, the small one that you have now. Um, this is going to be bigger, right? <clears throat> this is going to be better, right? So the same tactic that we, we use in that situation, we have to think the same way. If we think more about heaven and how much better and more fulfilling and more joyful life it's going to be over there, we're not going to be afraid to move. We're going to anticipate it and look forward to it. Um, and so that's the, the, the practical next step is that we compare. 
it's okay to compare the two, to compare this life and to compare the next, right? Um, <clears throat> and it's kind of like the same idea of, uh, let's say you go on vacation and you have a wonderful time and you say, I just want to live here forever. You want to live in that hotel room compared to the, the mansion that you have, uh, which is maybe 10 or 20 or 30, 100 times bigger than, than that little 400 square feet uh, place. Um, <clears throat> so start really comparing the two, right? Um, uh, or it's the same idea as the, the church teaches again, as uh, a woman preparing herself for her wedding, right? She is joyful in anticipating the best day of her life, knowing full well that there will be change. She knows that she's going to have to leave the house of her father and her mother. She knows that she will not spend as much time with her friends as, as she did before. Um, there's going to be a change. She may even have to move across the country or to another country, but she's willing to accept all of this. Why? Because of love, because of her bridegroom, because this, this was the plan all along um, and everyone knew it. Maybe they were, people are in denial about, but it's going to happen. Um, <clears throat> and so out of extreme love and joy for her husband and a new hope and for a new life with, with him, she accepts all of these small sacrifices compared to the big gains that she will receive, right? This is how we should feel a, a, about death, um, at least on the mental level. You know, when it comes to the emotional level and the physical, yes, it's difficult. Um, but it, it should be the mental and the spiritual exercise that overcomes these, these emotions, right? <clears throat> As the church says, there's no death but a departure. It's not the end of the story is to move out of your house, no. The end of the story is to go to a bigger and better one, right? Um, <clears throat> it's, it's simply a transition from one place to another. Um, it's not an end, it's a new beginning. Um, I, I know we all know these things, but this is why the church says, okay, we have to, we have to put things in perspective and remember the goal. The goal is not to live it up here. No, no, it's to prepare for the, the much better place over there. <clears throat> and so we begin to change what we do here in order to have a more blessed and fulfilling life there. Um, uh, and so the Christian sees life and death differently as St. Paul did. He said what? For me to live is Christ. That's that's a little vague, right? But what he's trying to say is no longer, he said another place in Galatians, um, it's no longer I who live, but uh, Christ who lives in me. So the one who gave me life and he was offering me eternal life, this is my purpose. This is the one who I put everything into perspective. Um, and how did he, okay, so if, if to live is Christ, then what about death? He said to die is what? gain it's a benefit why because i get closer to christ I, I become more one with him compared to it's it's the difference between the engagement and the wedding or the the marriage that after that right what's better of course the marriage right um so the same idea can imagine someone who just want oh, let's just stay engaged for the rest of our life say i would say, no thank you um i'll find someone else Right? The purpose is not just to be engaged. Right, This is the engagement period. <laughs> um, it's nice, but there's something much better. Um, <clears throat> and so the more we reflect on the death and the afterlife, the more we're able to put things in the proper perspective and priorities. We, uh, like um, the bride who is preparing for her wedding or the student who is preparing for that final exam has to make some sacrifices. Um, why in order to have uh, success, and, and fruitfulness. Um, and so, um, uh, if we pour out all of our years focusing on anything or anyone more than Christ um, and the kingdom of the Lord, we will be empty and disappointed and hurt and might not even attain uh, that thing, right? So sometimes people put others um, whom they love as higher priority than the Lord. Right? What happens if, if, if something happens to them or your relationship with them it gets sour or, God forbid, God takes them away early? Then how are you going to feel? Miserable, right? And you, you invested all... Of, that doesn't mean we don't love people and, and enjoy the, the, the fellowship that we have here on this earth, but 
It has to be put in perspective with our heavenly bridegroom, right? If, if we love that person, then God takes them, oh, at least they're with the bridegroom now, right? Uh, that gives some sort of consolation uh, to us. <clears throat> so whatever we put a higher priority than, than our Lord um, or than the kingdom, um, take care. Because if and when you lose that thing, because all of these things of the world are temporary, um, then, then what? So that's why we, we have to remember what comes after, right? Um, <clears throat> as Saint, uh, the Lord says in the Gospel according to St. Matthew, he says, what is a prophet a man if he gains the whole world? Uh, let's say you were uh, ri so rich and famous and powerful that you attained the whole, th the whole world. You were in charge. You were the, the, the emperor of, of the world. Uh, it's probably never happened really, um, but let's just say it did. Even if, you, if, even if that happened, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, it, it, it will be short-lived based on even your life. And I guarantee you, you wouldn't be happy. You wouldn't, you wouldn't. Um, there's so many people, so many stories of people who get rich and famous and wealthy and powerful and there's, they're empty inside, right? Um, <clears throat> so th there's a story I was reading the other day about um, an atheist uh, mother who came and had her daughter baptized. And the priest asked, well, why? why? You know, he's like, I live my life and I'm empty. I don't want this for my child, right? So <clears throat> um, we have to remind ourselves, as, as the Lord says, what profit is it if you gain now all of these things that you are focusing on, but you lose your salvation, you lose your kingdom, you lose your bridegroom. Um, <clears throat> uh, that will not be a pleasant situation to, but everything we do now affects where we will go later right um <clears throat> and so when i remember where i'm gonna go later then i change what i do now whether intentionally or unintentionally um it just it's a byproduct of the contemplation of death and the kingdom <clears throat> and so um i begin to live more carefully more wisely and more purposefully when i put heaven in the, the, the forefront of, of my thoughts. Um, <clears throat> what else do, ends up happening? Like the bride, I, end, I prepare myself by beautifying myself with virtue, right? Um, and, and cultivating uh, the heart for, for the new life, right? Um, so uh, this is what... Um, this is what, in a sense, on the on the first day of the baptism, right? Um, especially for the children, we bring the the parents and the sponsors, um, and and the people who 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 are going to have interaction with the child, and we say, you have to make sure that they are set on the right track. You have to sow in them beautiful qualities and virtues. Um, for example, we say, sow in them righteousness, praise, purity obedience, love, and holiness, compassion, charity, and justice. Why all these things, right? So that your souls and your children's souls may live, right? For, for eternity, right? It's not just, oh, look how cute the baby is. Uh, this is so nice. Yes, <laughs> uh, that, that goes without saying. But the purpose is, okay, this, you, we have given this person new life, and they're an inheritor of the kingdom of heaven. And so walk in a worthy, proper of that kingdom. You have to teach them all about these things. Um, <clears throat> and so um, the, the, the Christian has the joyful anticipation of the bride for her, for her wedding. It's not an end, but a new beginning. Um, and so we prepare. Um, uh, like the Lord says, I think we mentioned this before, but in the gospel according to St. John, uh, the Lord says, in my father's house are many mansions. And I go, and then he says, I go to a, prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. <clears throat> and so um, we mentioned this before, but just uh, I think it was in the Passion Week sermon. But um, basically, the, in the Old Testament, um, in, in the Jewish uh, tradition back then, um, there would be a certain um, steps for, for betrothal and marriage, right? So after the bridegroom came 
to the house of, of the bride and spoke um, to the father um, and offered his proposal. Once the proposal was accepted by both the, the daughter and, and her, or the bride and her father, um, he would, um, before he left, he would say, I go and prepare a place for you. Um, and I will return for you when it is ready. When is it going to be ready? I don't know. Why? He had to go back to his father's house, the groom, to his father's house, and the father would, would, and he told, would tell him, okay, prepare a place for her here in, in, this, in this house. Build another um, uh, wing for, for you and, and your bride. <clears throat> um, so, um, okay, how long is it going to take? I don't know. Um, and who, who is the one who checks and to make sure that the, the construction is, is uh, successful and, and strong at the father, the father of the groom. So the father of the groom gives the, the groom okay to, okay, now go bring your bride and you can live here. Right? <clears throat> so that's why he says only my father knows because the father is the one that grants permission for the son to come and bring uh, marry his bride and bring her. <clears throat> Right, um, so he was not allowed to skimp on the work, right? And he had to get his father's approval. So it would vary from days to years, um, based on uh, either the, the construction um, or based on um, the approval of, of, of the father. <clears throat> and so that's why the Lord, in a sense, says, "No one knows of the day, not even the angel of heaven, but my father only." Right? Of course, the father and the son and the Holy Spirit are one. And um, they all know, but here he's saying it in a different way, um, whether this way or as as the son of man, because um, <clears throat> man cannot know, but as God he knows. Um, so to, to conclude, um, we see that um, our responsibility is is to think about our life now, to contemplate about the day of our death, and to go deeper into what happens after that um, with the kingdom of heaven, God willing, and to prepare ourselves for that. This is, this is what I think the purpose of these next two weeks are in the church. Because sometimes in the secular new year, we, we just say, oh, let's hope to have a better year next year than this year. But the church says, no, no, let's evaluate what happened last year um, so that we can modify and correct and better than so it's not by chance um, or rejoicing that a new year has come but we have to it's on us um, to make sure we're living a life proper and pleasing uh, to God that we may hear the joyful voice saying well done good and faithful servant you are faithful over a few things I'll make you ruler over many things enter into the joy of your Lord and glory be to him now and from